broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, yeah, we got Justin live. Thank you for... Yes, we got Justin live. Um, this is the, I think, only time you've been on camera for this long. Oh, and he's gone. And he's gone. Oh, I, I knew I, I had a small chance, so I had to do it. <laughs> Back. <laughs> and then he's gone. I think uh, for the 27 people that are here, you guys are the luckiest people because that is the uh, longest Justin has ever been on camera for. And also probably the, sad to say, last time he'll uh, make yeah. a short appearance with us. But we'll get into that in a little bit. For those of you that are here, thank you so much for joining us for today's webcast. Keanu, this is your first webcast with us, correct? Yes, it is. Yes. So it's really awesome to have you here. Um, and you actually already know Megan, don't you? I do. Yeah. I do. We have a we've had a great long term relationship. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> oh, that was that just seemed awkward. So just so you know, um, context. Uh, <laughs> Keon and I used to work together. So um, I, when I came over, I, I, um, I made sure to have a place here for Keon as well, because he was really great to me. Um, and so I wanted to make sure I paid that forward. So thanks and welcome to this side of the house. It's, it's fun to have you. It's good to see you again. Yes, yeah, it's, it's my pleasure to be here. You know, I, John and I know each other also, but I probably know him more than he knows me because he's so popular, yeah. but he used to uh, float around with a company called Ions, and he was a uh, faculty member. So every time mm -hmm. he came to Atlanta, because I was a member of Ions, I always made it a point to come hear what he had to say. And so it's good that we've come full circle. You know, it's maybe 10 years we've been having this um, dance on and off. And so anything I could do to support him, Wild West, Megan, everything's in the right category for the things that I'm willing to donate my time and my talents to. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, welcome again. And uh, Shelby generally goes over some housekeeping notes. Um, so we'll let her go to that. And then we'll get into, you know, our pre show, which generally consists of talking about a whole lot of nothing. Yes. So uh, for those of you that are for those of you that are new to Wild West Hacking Fest, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Um, I am going to share a link to our Discord server inside the GoToWebinar chat for everybody. It, like I said, if you are new, uh, we do use our Discord server for the chat during all of our webcasts and for our trainings. Um, if you take one of our anti-siphon training courses, you get two private channels for it. Um, but today we are going to be in the live chat, which is the channel with the little steer head on it. And um, if you are new to our server, I believe you have to wait five minutes before you're gonna be able to post in any of the channels. But after that, you can uh, feel free to share any gifts uh, as we really do enjoy those, um, along with any questions you have during the webcast today. And Kiana is on our server as well. Um, he goes by Chemical Key. Um, and if this is your first time joining us, this is not the actual webcast yet. This is our pre-show banter. Um, as we like to say, we show up early because you show up early, and then you show up early because we show up early. It's a vicious cycle that we love so much. We even made a t-shirt about it, which uh, Ryan is actually sporting right now for us, um, which you can actually grab at our Spearfish General Store. Um, we well, don't actually, I don't have think it. we can't. I, I, I think was about our store to say, is still closed. Yes, we don't have the store up quite yet. Um, we shut it down a little bit because of Way West. We uh, shut it down for that month so we could work on shipping the swag bags and all that stuff. But it will be up and running again at the beginning of July. So, so soon. Uh, yes. yes. And uh, today's webcast is going to be recorded. So if you can't stick around for the entire thing, that's OK. Uh, we'll have the recording up on our Discord server, on our YouTube channel. And if you're attending today, you'll also receive a certificate of attendance via email as well. Great. So, and I think on. this is our, our first webcast since Reno. Yes. So yes. pardon us if we're a little bit rusty. Yeah. <laughs> if you joined us in Reno too, we'd love to hear um, any thoughts in the uh, Discord server as well. Yeah, I was going to wear my there. orange t-shirt today. And I was like, you know, it's, it's a little too soon. It's a little too soon for that. Yeah. 
So Megan, I sent you were going to uh, ask me why in the world did I pick Chemical Key as a screen name? <laughs> yes, that is. Yeah, I want to know that. Yeah. All right. So, so I happen to give a little backstory. I happen to be a gamer as well, but um, before I was a gamer and before I did a lot of things, my first real professional job was as a chemical weapon specialist in the army. And so, you know, in the army, everybody has a nickname. Uh, a lot of people called me Will because my last name was Williams and they were just too lazy to um, put the other half of the name on there. And then the really close people called me Key. So it was really just the mashup of um, my role, chemical weapons. I blew stuff up and threw green gas around. And then just my nickname, everybody called me Key. And that's how you get it. That's awesome. Nice. Do you have any fun stories you can share about? Um, go ahead you got to tell me the about because i almost gave you a story and it might have gone in the wrong direction <laughs> just about being in chemical weapons um so th one of the things i appreciate about the chemical core for the army because i only know the army is that every unit in the army has at least one chemical person and so it, there are some really interesting parallels between being a chemical weapons specialist and being a security professional you know it is my opinion that every organization regardless of their size, needs at least one dedicated security person. You know, for a small business, you don't really need more than one person that knows what they're doing. But as the business grows in size, you need more and more people. And so that's one interesting parallel between what I do now and what I did in the Army. The other thing that really stands out is that when I was in the Army and I was not part of a chemical company where everybody in the unit was chemical, but I was a chemical person supporting something like um, communications, or other things, nobody else wanted to do what I was doing and nobody else cared about what I was talking about. And so the, um, the joke that they use for chemical, you know, it's nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons, so they called it NBC. What they turned that into was nobody cares because nobody cared about doing the training, nobody cared about putting on their chemical equipment, nobody cared about learning how to use their gas mask until everybody was deployed to the Gulf War. And it's a similar thing that happens in security where Nobody seems to care about what the security team is doing. They just want the results. They want things to work. Nothing can ever go down. And if there's a problem, it's the security team's fault, not the business for making bad decisions or not other people for doing crazy things. And so it's just really interesting how my military life and what I do professionally have so many parallels. But it's also the thing that keeps me calm because I got beat up and raked over the coals for years and years and years as a soldier. And so it's nothing different in the real world as a civilian. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I'm gonna share a bunch of uh, the rock gifts now because that's what you're reminding me of. Because that was Nick Cage's character. Uh, he was a chemical freak. You know, he did have a nickname previously, the Barry White of cybersecurity. Oh, yes. here's Velda. You know, I got my radio mic, you can see it in the screen and, you know, the radio voice. So I've been joking with people that I have a face for radio and <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll let the voice do all the work. <laughs> That's funny, Keon. I was told that I had a face for radio too. So, <laughs> and actually, I, I went to school for broadcasting. Did you? I didn't yeah, know that. I went to college for broadcasting, and then they told me I had a lift and uh, kiss it goodbye. <laughs> well, they can, they can all, you can laugh about it now because look at you now. Look at us now. Yeah, famous. Oh, so how's it going? I'm sorry I'm late, everybody. I just, I was working away here on stuff. I know, getting caught up and digging out from way west is um i think we're all still doing that yes i yep, told we're Velda talking. we're going to need to travel like once every couple of months to get back in the habit after being home for, with covid you know through the pandemic for so long but keon you actually have something coming up live right um and actually is it it's a hybrid event right not just in person or virtual correct yeah, so I, I started this conference in 2019 called the Cyber Strategy Retreat. And the entire motivation for the conference was to um, argue with people and stop people from being stupid, if we're being honest. And so like when I became a project manager, I became a project manager because project managers wouldn't listen to me because they said I didn't know what they were talking about. 
So I got their certification and said, well, now I have your certification and mine. Will you please do what I'm telling you to do? I'm trying to save the company. And the same idea came about with the strategy retreat where, you know, so I used to be a CISO as my full-time job. Now I do consulting and I run my own business. But when I was a CISO, I would go to CISO conferences. And so you have all these CISOs sitting around, you know, very hooty-tooty, you know, very high on themselves. And I, I love the people. I love the profession and the role. But I think one of the mistakes that some people make is that they talk trash about everybody else. And I said, it would be really interesting to bring the people that they're talking trash about to the table so they could defend themselves. And so now instead of having a bunch of CISOs saying, well, the CIO doesn't know what he or she is talking about and the business doesn't understand and I need to give them information in primary colors, I said, it would be a lot of fun to just bring them to the table so that when somebody says, well, you know, the board needs everything in elementary school content, somebody from the board can stand up and say, well, you have no idea the 200 hours of work that goes into a four hour board meeting. Or the CIO can say, you have no idea about all of the effort that goes into managing all the technology that supports the business. And oh, by the way, I also have to think about security and these metrics and the other information that you're getting. And it has led to some really interesting conversations over five events. Um, I'll tell the audience, you know, this is um, generally for executives, but I've grown to form the opinion that the best thing that you can do for entry level people is to give them executive content. And so because nobody from the hacking cast is going to fly to Atlanta, if you do, you're welcome to come help me eat the food. But anybody who wants to come can come as my guest free of charge. I'm not charging. I'm not selling anything. I came to give education. Um, Malcolm Harkins and I are friends. He was the first CISO at Intel. So he will be my virtual host for all the sessions. But because I'm doing it on Microsoft Teams, I can support 10,000 people before it shuts down. And I don't expect 10,000 people to show up. So you guys are more than welcome to come and hang out with us on the 14th and 15th of July. Sounds like an awesome opportunity, Keon. I know when Megan and I work, Megan and I have worked together forever, right? I mean, we've been at numerous businesses. And this is one of the things that was requested um, constantly for us is, is exactly what you're addressing through this. So I think it's fantastic. Well, you know, one of the other things that comes up, and it's the reason that I'm giving complimentary access to all the Hacking Cast people, is you have to be a CISO to go to a CISO event because the events are free and the person is the product. And so what generally happens, if I go to an event as a security executive and my admission is complimentary and nobody charged me anything, what they're really doing is setting it up for the sponsors to say, hey, we have all these fabulous people to whom you can pitch your wares. And so the attendees are the product and they don't have to pay for anything. For this one, I, I generally, I normally charge so we can make sure that the right people are there. Because nobody is gonna pay $650 for a VIP ticket if it's not the right fit. They're gonna say, I'm gonna spend $650 on something else. I'll get a new pair of shoes, I'll get a PlayStation 5, I'll go get a flat screen TV. But when you start getting into the executive realm, that's actually a cheap price for executive events, but it's extreme for entry level events. But when you start bringing entry level people to the table and say, hey, you've never had access to this, but you see what they're talking about and you see where everything is going, now you have more context for the job that you're doing. And that's part of my conversation when we get past the um, pre-show and into the real show, is really helping people understand from a business perspective, why does this thing that I do matter for the business and why do they care and what are they doing with the security report that I did or what are they doing with my app scan or what are they doing with anything that I did from an offensive perspective? It all folds into the context of the business and how it works and how they're making decisions about risk management and compliance and incident response and everything else. And my hope is that by having the executive perspective, anybody who participates with us has a better understanding of why their job matters. You know, you imagine that you're a SOC analyst and you go to work every day, and the best case scenario at work is that you had enough problems for you to manage, rather than having more problems that you can handle and something broke and you get fussed at. It's always good to know that your work actually does provide value. And even if you feel like you're getting beat up every day, if it wasn't for you, nothing would happen correctly. And the other cool thing is that the main conference is on Pacific time because I've recognized that some web events that are all day events start too early in the morning for people on the West Coast. Yeah. And so our official start time is 11 Eastern, which means if you're in California or Washington or Oregon, I'm not asking you to get up at five in the morning to participate. I'm saying, hey, you would have been at work at eight o'clock anyway. 
even if you don't watch intently, you can listen in the background, have it up, and hopefully you'll learn something interesting from your participation. Do you record your events, Keon, um, for for people to go back? Yeah, for the um, for the cyber strategy retreat, we always record it. One thing that's really interesting when you do executive events is they don't have time to be at the event that they paid to attend. And so as a courtesy, I record all the sessions so I can say, hey, look, if you have a board meeting or something interesting happens, you've paid a lot of money to be here. There's no reason for you to not have the content. So we always record the cyber strategy retreat sessions. We started doing it last year and it works out well. Behind the scenes, I probably have 500 hours of content from events that I've recorded over the past couple of years. And so one day I'll compile it all and write a book and we'll have some interesting insights from a who's who of experts in IT and security and business. But it'll, it'll, um, it always works out well when you can say, hey, if you have something more important, you can always come back and get the recording. And so that'll apply to all of our Hacking Cast participants as well. If you have to go do something, because I'm telling you two weeks before it happens, that's really not a lot of notice to completely reschedule your day on the 14th and the 15th. But knowing that you can always come back and check out the recordings and then knowing that Malcolm Harkins is going to be the MC for all the online stuff kind of sets you up to know that it's at least going to be educational and informative. And the way that it works and function is that we're broadcasting live the conference that we're doing in Atlanta. When we do the roundtable discussions, you can't do a roundtable as a hybrid. So Malcolm will facilitate four roundtable discussions two each day so that the online audience has something dedicated to their participation. The live audience has roundtables that actually happen live. And then um, the recordings of all the sessions will be available to everybody. Sounds awesome. Yeah, it well, sounds so like a bunch of chickens on fire if you try to do a virtual and a live uh, roundtable <laughs> yeah, discussion. Mix. That's exactly what we just did at, at, way, at way West. <laughs> Exactly, Keon. What Megan just said is so true. And it's so different. It's such a different world now doing an in-person and virtual together. Ryan, I think you can probably attest to this on the back end. Behind um, the scenes, yeah. It, it was it was definitely a learning experience for all of us. Um, but it was it was very cool. And I, you know, we've got some great feedback and some great comments um, from our event at Way West um, in Reno. Not two weeks ago already. Can you believe it? No. So, for me, last week was still Reno part two. Yeah. The, the recovery. <laughs> it was. I don't know about you guys, but I still don't feel like I've caught up on my sleep from the Pacific time zone. Uh -uh. No. <laughs> I posted something in the chat. There is a um, post this. The attachment is CRJ underscore 16.2. So, um, Actually, I don't think Megan even knows this, but I know a couple of things about industrial control system security, and I know enough to be dangerous, but also enough that the Crisis Response Journal featured one of my articles in the late in the edition that came out last week. And so I posted a snippet on LinkedIn. If you look up, uh, if you look me up on LinkedIn, I'm easy to find. But uh, they said for special people, I can give them the entire magazine. And so anybody that's interested, that this edition of the journal, 16.2 is dedicated to industrial control systems and SCADA. And so it's not just my article, but in the uh, magazine, there's all kinds of great information. So for those of you who are, I should have wore my SANS ICS shirt, uh, my ICS security shirt, just in honor. I didn't know we were talking about um, <laughs> ICS security, but that's gonna be a great article with great, or it's a great magazine with great insights. It's gonna set anybody up for success who's interested in that. Um, I have to find it, so I'll post it in the chat later. But there was also something that came out this month where there are recommendations for secure POC coding. So for those of you that do SCADA, knowing that um, secure coding for programmable logic controllers is not something that has been around for a long time, there are some great people that put some information together to address that and try to improve the process. Um, also, as another free event, I'll send it to Megan and she can post it in the way that makes the most sense, but I'm doing a webinar next month because it's not july yet so on july 28th i'm doing a webinar where it's not me that's featured i'm featuring other people but i have some great people like the CISO for the kuwait oil company and some water people and some other operations technology people that have some great contents and information that they want to share and it's all vendor neutral 
you know, it's not a specific company. They're not selling anything. They're just doing what they do to make the world a better place. And it's great educational content for people who are going in that direction because we need a lot of people to solve the industrial control system security problem. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Yeah, and it, that's cool that um, it's Rick and Dave um, that are teaching that at um, Deadwood. That's going to be that's going to be an interesting class for them. It truly, it truly is. We also have um, somebody who's joined our pen test team here recently, um, Ashley. Uh, I can't remember her last name. I think it's Van Hoosen, um, and she has got a lot of knowledge on ICS, and she'll be doing some some talks at Deadwood as well. So. Good stuff all the way around here. All the way around. Do we have slides for today's presentation? Uh, yeah, you can't do a presentation without having slides. Otherwise, people fall asleep. <laughs> Somebody's asking for them in the um, in the slides channel. Can we yeah, get those I, posted? I can't remember the movie, but there was a great movie back in the day where they said, you asked for it, you got it. And then he said, Toyota. <laughs> And so I, I kind of had that thought when I saw the thing in the chat. So I'm, um, I'm uploading the slides as we speak. I just had to export them because the file is ridiculously large. But mm. you guys can have the slides in advance. You just got to promise to pay attention while I'm talking. <laughs> That's awesome. always a good thing, right? Yeah. So just a quick thing. Thanks for joining us again today. Um, we're very excited to have Keon be our, our guest speaker today on today's Hacking Cast. I am going to, in, this, in the channel, post um, all of our upcoming trainings for, for your reference. I will pin that if, you, if you'd like to take a look at what we have going on, um, all kinds of exciting stuff. So for those of you who are new to Wild West Hacking Fest, once again, thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, all of our chat during our uh, webcasts take place on our Discord server. I've gone ahead and shared a link to our Discord server inside the GoToWebinar chat for anybody who has not joined it already. So um, we are about at start time anyways. Unless there's any last words from Velda, I think we're ready to let you go. Nope. Just thank you again, Kian, for being our guest today. We appreciate it. And good luck with your event next month. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, so I'm going to, um, for the presentation, because it's just distracting for me. I'm going to turn my camera off so that you just hear my voice. And then we'll uh, turn the camera back on at the end. I set this up intentionally so that I am not talking at you for the entire time. So if you have questions as we go along, I will let our fabulous hosts um, kind of queue up the questions and prepare to quiz me at the end. What I wanted to do was just highlight a couple of things that are going to be important and set everybody up for success. You know, it's my pleasure to be here. Like I said, during the opening 30 minutes, if you didn't hear it, I love John. I love what he's doing. I love what's happening with the Wild West Hack and Fest. And I consider it a huge pleasure to be able to be here and support it with some educational content. In the big scheme of things, I'm really not a technical person, even though I started off as a telecommunication specialist. Way back in the day, I was the equivalent of a telephone operator. So if you go into the Wayback Machine and you think about people walking up and tapping the receiver a couple times so that it connects them to the operator, that was really my job using ISDN because I did ISDN switching and bridging. So I have a little bit of street cred when it comes to technology. It's just not the priority that I have these days because it takes a lot of brain power to stay up to date with all the technical things that are going on. And I apply my brain power in other places with all of that said, though, one of the things that I wanted to accomplish with this session was to present to the audience things that are going to set them up for success when you are producing the output that you produce. And so once upon a time, I ran the web application security team at one of the parts of the Centers for Disease Control. You know, I mentioned earlier during the opening 30 minutes that I was a CISO, and as part of my job, I had to take all of the output from technical security team members and then put that output into a business context to give it to the executives who were making decisions. And kind of thinking about that, I thought it would be constructive for this hacking cast to provide something different that you probably don't get all the time. Uh, I'm laughing at the jokes in the chat. You guys should keep up with that as well. But not everybody who is a technical specialist 
early to mid career has the same context and information about what's happening at the executive level. And so if I accomplish my goal, everyone, everybody will have better insight about how this works, what executives are thinking about, how you can set everybody up for success, and the world will be a better place because some of the most important people that we have within an organization are gonna be better professionals. Now, if you read the synopsis, one of the things you heard in the synopsis, or one of the things that you would have read in the synopsis was about Bear Bryant from the University of Alabama saying that offense sells tickets and defense wins championships. And so part of the context for this conversation is the difference between offensive security and defensive security. Um, when you look at the statistics, and I'm a football fan, not to a fanatic level, I don't know all the stats about everybody everywhere, and then I suffer because I'm an Eagles fan and they set me up for failure every year, but in football and in cybersecurity, some of the best teams that ever existed were the teams that had a great defense. Now, part of what helps you have a good defense is to have great offensive capabilities. So if you think about threat and vulnerability management at a program level, one of the things that you're trying to do in your threat and vulnerability management with penetration testing, with patching and vulnerability assessment, is to make sure that you understand the vulnerabilities that exist and then doggone it, do something about it so that you close the holes instead of selling or instead of selling the company down the river for a couple of fractions of a penny because most of the things that happen are preventable. You know, if you look at solar winds, I don't give them a lot of credit for saying that it was a junior person that caused the problem, but for solar winds, for colonial pipeline, for a lot of the breaches that have happened in the last 18 months, we'll say, just to keep the time frame consistent, most of those things were preventable. And I think if they had good people that were doing good assessments on the front end, it would have helped the organizations strengthen their defenses. Like there's no reason for you to have a major data breach because somebody compromises access control on your VPN, you shouldn't have insecure security solutions. Or, you know, there's no reason that an unpatched web facing server is compromised when you should have people internally doing assessments to identify that you have a patch that's missing so that you can apply the patch. And so there's something different between preventable compromises where due diligence and doing the right thing is going to set the organization up for success versus when you see in the news, they say it was um, a very capable hacker using something very novel and unique. 90% of the time, that's not really the case. Um, one of the other things that I'll say before we go forward is that I think part of the security problem, and this is more a leadership issue than it is a practitioner issue, is that a lot of security leaders don't present the value of security in the right context to the people who have the money and are making the decisions. And so you can kind of tell from the way that I've laid this out and the way that we're getting started, that if you didn't read the synopsis or if you were unfamiliar with me and my delivery style, this is probably not what you were expecting, but I promise you if you stick around and hang out and continue to be part of the conversation, you'll get something that's valuable that you should be able to apply to your work today. And then applying it to your work today is probably gonna lead some percentage of you to get raises, to get bonuses, or just to do something amazing for the organizations that you're supporting. Now, I'll tell you in advance what I'm not covering. This is about business context for technical professionals. That's why I gave you some of my background and I do understand technology, but we're not covering the technical analysis of the anatomy and of attack. We're not talking about industry cliches. I think it's a weak argument to say that people are the weakest link, even if people lead to breaches. I have no conjecture about the state of cybersecurity because in reality, the security of a company is based on the effectiveness of the application of limited resources to solve a problem that they're facing. And so if you keep that in mind, if you're taking notes, because I teach um, collegially sometimes, that is a good note to keep as a reference. Most of the things that we're doing in cybersecurity are done based on limited resources. I've never seen a company, even banks, where uh, a bank that used to be based in Atlanta had 160 people on their security team. There is a lot of constraint that still exists when you have 160 people. So there is no unlimited amount of resources. And what generally happens is that at the executive level, the CISO says, I was given this amount of budget. The things that I have to do exceed my budget based on priority and impact to the organization 
I'm going to do the best that I can with the resources that I have available so that we can help the organization operate within their risk tolerances. Um, it's not part of this conversation at a deep level, but one thing I want everybody to think about related to risk management is that there are really only three things that happen when you talk about cybersecurity risk management. The business should define your risk appetite, which says how far are we willing to go to accomplish our goals? Once your risk appetite is established, part of that risk appetite is gonna influence the resources that are dedicated to the security program. And with that risk appetite, if you're doing your risk management qualitatively, anything that falls within the boundaries of risk taking defined by risk appetite is going to be a low risk. Anything that starts getting close to the upper limit or the threshold of your risk taking is going to be moderate. And then anything that exceeds your capacity for risk taking, which is the upper boundary and people are calling in the Marines because something went wrong, is going to be a high risk. If you guys keep that in mind, um, what we're going to do is return back to that idea later in the presentation because it influences the way you present your results and your findings when you are doing penetration testing or red team exercises or tabletop exercises or anything else. What you really want to communicate to the business is I found something that goes way beyond our ability to manage the risk and we need to do something about it so that we reduce risk to an acceptable level. Now, if you present your findings from your application scan or your penetration test or your vulnerability assessment or any other thing that you're doing offensively, the result is going to be much more valuable because business people who don't do what you do are going to say, ah, I get it. My capacity for risk taking limits me to losing a million dollars per financial quarter. And the security team is telling me that we're going to lose $10 million because we haven't spent $50 to patch a system that's in a publicly facing server. And so they're not gonna break it down like that, but that's what's actually happening in the real world. And that's the focus of my conversation is to talk about the context. And so where I'm not talking about the state of security or cliches or reverse malware analysis, there are plenty of people that can walk you through that. So I'm really not the best person. My goal is to give you a business conversation that outlines reasonable actions that everybody at every level in the security profession can take to achieve success and to support the organizations that have hired you. And so one of the things that I ask when I give a presentation to business people is what is the first thing that comes to mind when you hear the word cybersecurity? Um, I don't have an official scientific poll, but if you, uh, if you accept that I have talked to maybe 5,000 people in the last six months for different reasons, most of those 5,000 people imagine somebody in a hoodie because of marketing and silly things in Hollywood. They imagine some kind of keypad or lock because that is the imagery that people use to represent the cybersecurity industry. They, get, they think about control catalogs. If it's something, somebody in a business who is not a security person, but they deal with security and compliance, you know, they think of their favorite compliance requirements. You would be shocked at the number of people that can cite a requirement from PCI DSS or GDPR, but they have no idea how they satisfy the requirements or they think about data breaches and incidents. But if you look at the cybersecurity profession, across the profession, we have a lot of people that do a lot of things. You have analysts, you have engineers, you have technical people, you have administrative people. Um, when I was a CISO, I had a technical writer and a marketing person because we needed to communicate clearly and effectively to people that didn't spend every day doing what we were doing. And so we have a broad profession that is open to everybody, but some of the imagery and the way that other people communicate what we do are because of the silly things that Hollywood has done in movies like, uh, well, I'm not gonna pick on any movies, but there are a lot of movies where everything is very fantastic, or there are even TV shows where people break out a cell phone and they're connecting to a satellite, and it's not even the same network or communications protocols. The general public has an incorrect assumption about the value that security brings. So it becomes very important that we as professionals, regardless of the level that we're operating, have the ability to communicate what is cybersecurity really and why does it matter? Fundamentally, cybersecurity just describes the protection of computer systems and networks from theft or damage to their hardware, software, electronic data, and it also contributes to preventing disruptions or misdirection of services that they provide.
And I threw misdirection in there intentionally because when people talk about um, business continuity planning, it's always talking about, you know, the system is down. We got to execute our disaster recovery plan and reconstitute somewhere else. But there are a lot of situations where you are misdirecting or redirecting traffic. You think about a man in the middle attack or you think about business email compromise where we are causing people to send money to a location that it shouldn't be sent. All of that falls in the definition of cybersecurity, but the common definitions, when we talk about it, even if you just talk about confidentiality, integrity, and availability, lead everybody to think about technology. You know, there's this aspect of cybersecurity that relates to people, process, and technology, but technology is the greatest priority on a lot of security teams and a lot of companies. And if, you're, if your company is driven by regulatory compliance, most of your regulatory controls are technical controls, and they forget all about the process, and there's very little consideration for people. I happen to be a people person. I love training, which is why I'm here, and making people smarter produces better outcomes. The thing that I want to make everybody smarter about is just understanding that your communication in a business context is the best thing that you can possibly do professionally to support the business that you're supporting. So if the business starts to grow to understand that people are important and combining the skill and the knowledge and the ability of people with processes and technology that exist in the organization is going to put them in the right frame of mind to think about what is the value of the security analyst to contribute to the risk management program for the company? Or how are these security people, in addition to incident response and breach response, adding value to what we're trying to do when we're selling a widget or providing a service or doing something else, and who's looking at all of our controls and making sure that they're configured properly and making sure that we have spent the company's resources because risk management is a business decision. We wanna make sure that the business manages risk in a reasonable way. And part of that reasonable way depends upon a relationship and communication, but not just the CISO, but anybody that you run into walking around who's contributing value to the organization. And so a couple of things that I want to make sure that everybody understands, and this is for all audiences, whether you've never been in security, you're entry level, or you're an executive. And if you are a CISO and you want to argue with me later, I'm happy to argue live in front of the camera and we'll see how it goes. But there are a bunch of realities that you always need to consider from the point of view of the audience that's receiving the information rather than the point of view of the person contributing the information. And so when you think about the recipient of the information, Reality number one is that supply chain attacks aren't new. They've been around forever. And the issue is that we're just getting worse at managing the risk. And so if we use 2013 as an example, because most people can look this up and there's still authoritative sources that talk about it, from November to December of 2013, hackers gained access to millions of people's credit card data and personal information related to Target's point of sale system. Now you will notice that I did not put Target on my slide because I'm not picking on the company. And a lot of people got very excited about supply chain management and what the HVAC vendor did or didn't do, but there were some breakdowns all up and down the security management and risk management chain. You know, there were issues related to monitoring. How do you process all of the information that your MSSP is giving you? How do you prioritize and respond to things properly? If you fast forward to 2018, um, I don't have it on the slide, but if you look it up, the Singh Health data breach was a similar situation where in the Singapore health system, 1.5 million records and all of the information about the prime minister, who they found out later was the target of the attack, was exfiltrated when they had the right controls in place to prevent it from happening. The issue wasn't that the external controls were bad. The issue wasn't that the technical teams that did all these um, offensive security didn't find a problem and fix it. Most of the problem was related to configuration management because they were upgrading their infrastructure and they had a server that fell out of configuration management that nobody was paying attention to that ended up being the pivot point for the initial attack. And then the people in charge of incident response did not understand and did not respond properly based on their documented procedures. What is an incident? How do we respond and how do we escalate it? And so in that case, you had great offensive people that identified all the holes, fixed the holes and closed it down. It was the incident response and some of the defensive people 
who failed to support the organization. And so there's case after case intentionally avoiding some of the things that have happened recently where there are all kinds of supply chain attacks where your third party vendors or somebody that you trust or somebody that you're working with is going to be part of your problem rather than part of the solution. Now, when you think about a managed service provider or a managed security service provider, they're supposed to be the organizations that you work with to solve the problem. But then we also have cases of MSPs and MSSPs being the root of our supply chain issue rather than being the solution to the issues that we face. And so in 2019, 22 municipalities in Texas were victims of ransomware attacks because all 22 municipalities used the same MSP to provide remote services and remote monitoring. So the Texas Chief Information Security Officer offered five MSP-oriented lessons related to reducing supply chain attacks. You know, she said, only allow authentication to remote access software from inside the network, use two-factor authentication, which people keep saying, and it keeps getting ignored, and people keep having multi-factor and two-factor authentication issues. But you really want to use um, two-factor or multi-factor authentication for remote administration and virtual private network. You know, secure your remote access is a great mantra and a great shield and a great sign to carry around because it's going to drastically reduce the risk that the organization is facing. And then from more technical perspectives, she said that you want to block inbound network traffic to and from Tor nodes, block outbound traffic to Pastebin, use endpoint detection and response to detect PowerShell and other unusual processes. These are all great things that can be done that the security team can add value to, but the, the supply chain reality is not going away. Now I can count, but I accidentally misnumbered this because I removed a slide. So the next reality, we'll just fast forward in the future to reality three, is that it's impossible to have a complete understanding about all the technology that you have. So I have the pleasure of knowing um, SPAF from Purdue, and it's really interesting talking to security people who have been doing this since the 60s and the 70s, because they lean back in the chair, they have their ascot, they have their cognac and their pipe, and they have something in there that they're puffing on. And you see the eyes roll back in their head and you hear that good old phrase, back in my day, people could reverse engineer everything on the mainframe, debug, find a problem because they understood the entire scope end to end of the technology that was used to support the business. You know, back in the day, you, one person could develop a complete understanding of every component and subsystem in the mainframe and if something needed to be fixed, that one superhero would fix it. Today, in 2021 and looking into the future, you almost need an army of specialists who are experts in the incremental parts of the puzzle. You have all these cloud security people. Um, I love the Cloud Security Alliance because they are vendor neutral. And um, Dave does some great things with some of the standards that they put out. But even looking at the Cloud Security Alliance, you know, you have virtual machine technology, you have hypervisors, you have virtual network components, you have the virtual operating system, and there's a lot of things that happen between all of those components in addition to security in the cloud and security of the cloud and the shared responsibility matrix between your company and your cloud service providers or your chain of cloud service providers if you're using multiple cloud services to string them together to build an application or a solution that supports the business. And so with all of that complexity, you have lost the ability for small groups of people to understand end-to-end -end everything that's happening. And as you increase in complexity, the risk that you have to manage also increases, sometimes exponentially. And so the question that it leaves you with, given this reality, is how do you really protect what you don't understand? And then you add on top of that, no organization has unlimited resources. So we're protecting something that we don't understand with limited resources that don't provide a complete solution to the entire problem. And so it starts to paint the picture that the business needs to understand so that they are making good decisions. Now, I think one of the worst decisions that businesses use to drive the solution to the security problem is allowing compliance to be the primary driver. When you think about compliance, compliance is the bare minimum requirement for everybody in the industry, but the bare minimum was never meant to be the complete solution for the situation that you're facing. 
And so if you look at um, PCI DSS, credit to the payment card industry that they are always updating the standard and they're always updating the approach. And, you know, if you look at NIST, NIST is always updating the, the revision number for the special publications that are used to support the security programs that people are building. And ISO does the same thing with ISO 27005 and with the 27001 and 2 that support the development of an information security management system. But the limitation with compliance, and even to an extent, the limitation with some of those neutral frameworks is that compliance doesn't consider the business goals and the objectives of the organization that has to secure their assets and information. Compliance doesn't consider the business strategy and the requirements for execution. All PCI knows is that I need to protect credit card information within the scope of the card processing domain, and they don't care anything about anything else that happens within the organization when you really boil it down to their priorities. Compliance simply identifies the minimum requirements for the concern or for the activity, and we can apply that to GDPR because their GDPR is really only concerned about data transfer for the personal information for citizens of the European Union and the European Economic Area. GDPR cares nothing about people from Australia or Canada or Brazil or anywhere else. And when you start using compliance as the driver, what you end up doing is stringing together multiple frameworks and multiple requirements to satisfy a subset of all of the risks that the organization faces. Also, if you look at the number of data breaches that have happened in the last 18 months, just to keep your research simple, almost 90% of the organizations that have had a breach or a compromise or a ransomware attack where it was publicly disclosed and ended up in the news satisfied the regulatory requirements for their industry. So NERC SIP, Colonial Pipeline satisfied all their requirements to my knowledge. On target was PCI compliant when they were compromised. SolarWinds satisfied their compliance and regulatory requirements for operating, but they still had an issue. And so compliance is really the beginning of the conversation. It is not the goal or the result of what's supposed to happen. Another reality that we're facing is that a lot of security leaders only understand security and their ability to communicate the value of security to non-technical business people is limited. And I myself was in that category. Um, my first job as a CISO, the business assigned me somebody outside of my reporting chain who was a non-technical business executive, and he was supposed to help me not be stupid. That is not what they wrote on paper, but that was the function that he served in my life. And, you know, many, many years later, I continue to thank him for saving me for myself, or I thank him for saving me from myself. And the thing that I was doing that made no sense is I never thought about the people who received the information that I was providing. And so his job was for me to run everything by him before I gave it to my chain of command so that they can do something with it. And I swear for the first 90 days that we ended up working together, he said, Keon, I have no idea what you're talking about. What does this mean? What is this acronym? What is that acronym? Why do I care? What's in it for me? I mean, he really helped me improve my communication and the way that I presented data simply by asking me questions that demonstrated he had no idea what was on the paper. And my reports were ridiculously long because I started off as a technical person. And so you think about if I do a, uh, if I run AppScan or WebInspec or HP Fortify, even on a small web application, I'm probably gonna end up with 50 or more pages of data. And I tried to take all of that data and consolidate it and boil it down to what made sense and what was important. And even then I failed and had 20 and 30 pages that were a subset of the 50 and 60 pages that made no sense to non-technical business people. And that is an issue that a lot of security leaders face. And so I implore all of you who are at the beginning of your careers to start working on your communication, to think about the recipient that is receiving what you have to give them rather than thinking about what it is that you know and what you understand. You know, there is some great content from people like Seth Godin, who in his book, This Is Marketing, has a great segment that talks about dealing with irrational people, where he said, it is very important to understand that the people that you're communicating with don't know what you know, don't care what you care about, and, don't, and are not always driven by what you're driven by. And using that as the foundation of your communication 
it allows you to start thinking about how do I frame the message in a way that's going to resonate with the person that I'm giving this to. Now, part of what's going to contribute to that, and I've done research and, you know, I teach at Georgia State periodically and I've taught at other schools. I taught at the University of Phoenix. Uh, what I found is that in most of your security education, whether it is academic or it's certification based or it's just publicly available information, there is very limited business content in security education. And so you can look it up yourself. If you could, the uh, NSA has the Centers for Excellence in Cybersecurity Education. So they certify a whole bunch of schools for the excellence in the knowledge and skills and abilities that are developed in their academic programs. And none of those programs have any business content. Like my master's degree is in business, but my first um, secondary degree was going to be a master's of science in computer science and nothing in my course schedule had anything to do with business. I had to learn to program in C. I'm not a programmer, but they wanted me to understand C and assembly languages and computer engineering so that I could be a better security person. But that is a great example of the entire focus was on the technology part and there was no content about people or process or there was no consideration for how do I transform all of this information that I'm producing into a format that the people who are making the decisions and the people who control the budgets are going to be able to make an informed choice about the best approach to take moving forward. That leads us into reality six, which is technically reality five, because I can't always count. But most organizations also don't have the capability to manage just the top 20 from the Center for Internet Security Controls. So I can't remember the date. I didn't write it down, but it's generally common knowledge in the industry that at one point, I think it was the attorney general in the state of California said that they were going to hold all businesses, all California businesses to a higher standard if they had a data breach and didn't meet all 20 of the CIS top 20 controls. That sounds great in theory. But when you break it down, and I'm a super fan of CIS, it is a great way to start building a program, especially for a smaller medium business. But when you look at the sub controls for the top 20 controls, you have more than 100 things that have to be done. And so to simply say, oh, there's just 20 things that a business needs to do without considering the industry or the impact or the budget or the cost for implementing the primary controls and all their subcomponents and all of the related things that need to be in place foundationally. Now you don't really have something that's just 20 controls that you can flippantly say, everybody should do these 20 things. It is much more complex and much more robust than that. And so the control catalog is a good way to allow you to measure and evaluate do we have the right things in place and have we done basic hygiene? But there's always going to be something that takes you beyond the 120 controls that you put in place with CIS. Or since I work for the government, I know that the one of the older versions of the NIST 800-53, if I implemented all the controls and the control enhancements for a system that had a high baseline, my system security catalog documented 630 controls. 630 controls across multiple families that have a number of nuances. And then we're depending on enterprise controls versus system controls versus the shared responsibility matrix for anything that we had deployed in GovCloud requires an army of people to manage all of that. And so most organizations need to think properly about how much budget and resource and time and energy are we going to allocate to staffing? For everything that I've talked about, even if we talk about a small business with 100 people, one security person out of 100 people that wants to fully implement the CIS controls is going to require a couple of years if you don't have outside support from consultants or other people. And it's just a small example of the picture that we're facing. Or it's a small example of the realities that organizations are facing. In addition to the business realities, because I want you to be better business communicators, you also have security realities. And one of the biggest security realities is the place that you sit in the business and who you are talking to and how you talk to them. And so in CISO circles, there is a lot of discussion and debate and conversation about who the CISO should report to. Should the CISO report to the CIO or the CFO or directly to the CEO or to the board of directors? And I'm not here to jump in on that debate. 
But what I do want to highlight is that the person that you talk to is going to receive information in a different way compared to other people. And so if I'm reporting to the chief financial officer, chief financial officers think differently than the chief operating officer who thinks differently than your general counsel, who thinks differently than the board, because most things that happen at the board level don't go directly to the board, they go to a committee. And in most boards of directors, the committee that looks at security is the audit committee. And the audit committee is focusing on compliance requirements across the entire organization, not just security requirements. And so there's some language and things like the OECD fact book um, I don't know if they published the one for 2021 because it was supposed to come out in June. But if you just Google OECD Oscar Echo Charlie Delta Factbook 2019, it will take you to a great document from the Organization of Economic Cooperative Development that talks about how boards work and what they think about. And what you find in that document is that they only talked about security on a paragraph in the entire document. And the simple thing that they said is that more and more organizations are adopting risk and audit committees and dedicating their focus to cybersecurity. And so even at the board level for some of the largest organizations in the world, there still isn't enough focus about cybersecurity. So making sure that you're providing the right content in the right format to the right person is going to be imperative if your goal is to drive results and improve the security situation that the organization is facing. Now, one thing that you're gonna to have to learn how to do, and again, it doesn't matter where you sit in the organization or what your job title is or what your role is, but you're going to have to make sure that you adjust the message for the audience that you're addressing. So Edward Tuft has the best class that I've ever taken. It's called uh, Presenting Data and Information. It has nothing to do with security. It really has to do with the way that you frame your message and the way that you present the content and the format that you use so that the recipient gets the best value from what you're talking about. And he does a great picture where he talks about uh, Napoleon's insane idea to attack Russia in winter and why he lost. And what he did in that picture was showed the, the size of the troops decreasing as they moved along the path back and forth so that you can visually see how everything works out. That is a good example of adjusting the message for the audience, because a lot of people who don't like history are not really interested in the story. They're looking at the content and the result and what was produced. And so thinking along those same lines and working to produce the same outcome, in a lot of cases, is going to be important to have quantitative analysis, qualitative analysis, put pictures on slides, have reports that reinforce your ideas, but all of the approaches support the idea that people learn and receive information either by hearing it, seeing it, doing it, or reading it. And so following the hear, see, do, read approach is gonna make sure that your content is in a format that resonates with the greatest number of recipients, especially if you're presenting to the board or senior leadership to make sure that they understand what you're saying. Another thing that's gonna be very important is the way that you measure and present information. And so I'm a fanatic about metrics. If anybody wants to um, hang out with me, I have all kinds of fun presentations and discussions about metrics. But what I have found personally is that metrics are one of the best tools to facilitate effective communication because you can't argue with the numbers if you can prove that the numbers are valid. And so by definition, a metric is simply a magical measurement of performance that every leader needs to learn how to create properly. Few leaders do it correctly, but because I'm encouraging all of you to be leaders in your area, everyone that's here should learn how to do this. I will tell you that the best guide for creating good security metrics is in NIST special publication 800-55. It is literally the guide for performance metrics for information security that nobody ever looks at because it's not covered by compliance, but it was part of my job because I was a um, federal employee when I was a security executive. And so NIST 800-55 ends up breaking metrics into three different categories. You have a category of metrics that talks about the effectiveness of the delivery of the security program. You have efficiency and effective measurements that talk about the delivery of security services. And then you have another category of metrics that talks about the results of security compromises on the organization. 
And so when I talk about framing the information for different audiences, it's the CISO and the CIO and leadership on the technology side that care the most about the execution of the programs that are in place, whether it's vendor management or it's identity and access management, pick your favorite program out of the security magical hat. And that top level metric is what the technology leadership cares about the most. The next set of metrics are really the metrics that technical security people are gonna care about because you wanna measure the implementation of your controls. If I'm doing DLP, if I'm doing, if I'm running a SOC, I care about the deployment of the technology and how well is it working and the percent of time it does what it's supposed to do versus the percent of time that it fails and then what happens when it fails and what's the impact on the organization. The third metric is what the board and senior leadership care about because what they care about is the impact on the organization and why does this matter and what do I need to do about it. And so when you're dealing with metrics, what you need to consider is that a metric is just the combination of data, the algorithm that you use, the algorithm for reducing it, and how you tell a story. And the story that you're telling is really what matters the most in the situation, depending on where you sit in the organization and the type of organization that you're working on and what their business and operational drivers happen to be. And so my self-assessment for everybody, and this is a rhetorical question, it's not really a quiz, but I encourage everybody who's participating to go back and think about anything that you have documented that meets the definition of a metric, and to what extent do your metrics represent the value that you add to the organization? Now, the best way to describe the value that you add to the organization is you need to understand the corporate strategy. And so then my follow-up rhetorical question is not written on the slide, but a good thing for you to consider for yourselves is do I know what the business does and why they do it and what they're trying to accomplish? And so, you know, when was the last time if you work for a publicly traded company, you probably have an investor relations page where the investor relations page says, where are we going and what are we doing and what are we trying to produce? That is great information for people who work in publicly traded companies to start framing I did a scan, I found this vulnerability, this vulnerability based on my findings is going to stop you from doing this thing that you said that you wanted to do on the investor relations page. And now it starts to put you in the position where you are extremely valuable because you're telling people things that matter. At the end of the day, what we're really trying to do is communicate the impact of your work and your is a broad variable that applies to everybody. And so you have to substitute Am I doing vulnerability assessment or penetration testing or vendor management or identity and access management or any of the other 5,000 things that security people do, but developing the ability to communicate to your boss and to the business and to the board if you have one, why does this thing that I do 40 hours a week, 52 weeks a year minus vacation matter to what the business is trying to accomplish? Then, whether you're a red team, a blue team, risk management compliance, or anything else, people start to recognize, why do I want John Doe or Jane Smith or whatever your name is to show up every day and sit in their seat and do what they do, whether they're doing it locally or whether they're doing it remotely? And one of the ways to do that, again, is to focus on business impact. The business only cares about business impact. The business does not care about the um, reverse malware analysis or the anatomy of an attack or anything else that you hear at a normal security meeting event or conference. Understanding the business impact and why the business cares is the best thing that you can do for yourself professionally. And it doesn't need to be only for CISOs. It just helps demonstrate why does the business want to keep paying you every pay period and what value do they get from having you around. And so it is a self-fulfilling prophecy that if you communicate very well the value of what you're offering, you're gonna be able to stick around, grow in your, in your career and keep food on the table and take care of your family. And when you're talking about business value, context matters. And that's kind of getting us to the end of my conversation so that we're all on the same page. And it'll also allow me to turn off the um, slides, turn on the camera, and then you can throw digital tomatoes at me if you choose. And so I assume that most people here can drive, have driven a car, or have been in an automobile that uses tires. And so the idea of a ball tire is going to apply to everybody regardless of your background. 
And fortunately, a ball tire applies to everybody in the world because we all use vehicles to get around in some sort of way. But if I say ball tire, you know, imagine that I have um, performed some kind of offensive security activity. I have generated a report of findings and I'm communicating this information to the business, to my boss and to other stakeholders that represent people who care. With that in mind, if I said, what is the risk of a ball tire? People are gonna start to assume things if I don't provide enough context. If I give no context, nine times out of 10, people assume the worst because most people know that driving on a ball tire can result in vehicle damage because the tire fails or you can't control the vehicle. Like if it's raining and you hydroplane, if your tires are bald, you have no traction whatsoever. And um, Brain Dance gave a great picture that you can look at in the chat, but it's gonna lead to destruction. Uh, even with brakes, you can have the best brakes in the world, but if you slam on the brakes and your tire, does, tire is bald, you have no traction and you're gonna slide and encounter whatever it is that you were trying to avoid. And so people think about the worst case scenario, given no context, but if I said the bald tire is not on a car, but here's the context, we have a bald tire, which represents our asset, but the asset is affixed to a tree. Now changing the context and giving enough information for people to understand the risk that they're facing completely changes the nature of the conversation. I might be concerned as all concern exists if I'm thinking about a ball tire on a passenger van and I have 50 kids inside the van, but 50 kids using a ball tire as a swing in the backyard is a completely different risk scenario. The risk magnitude also changes as the location changes. So if it's a ball tire on a car that's moving around, that is a very different risk scenario than a ball tire on a tire swing in the backyard at my house where everything is safe, nobody's gonna be hurt. But the other thing to think about is that if the context changes, my risk is also gonna move around. But now it's not the tire that I'm concerned about, but it's the rope that I'm concerned about. What is the quality of the rope? What is the ability of the rope? and the item to which the rope is affixed to carry the weight of the people in the tire swing. So like I used to kickbox, even though I still have plenty of muscle mass, I'm also old and lazy and fat. And so, you know, a tire swing that works for a nine-year-old is not going to work for me who weighs 300 pounds. If it's on a branch this week or if the rope is frayed, I'm gonna fall, I could potentially get hurt. The nine-year-old that weighs, I don't know what nine-year-olds weigh, but whatever they weigh, a nine-year-old on the same swing is exposed to less risk. So the more context I give you about the asset, the environment, the controls around it is going to give you more information so that you can make a good decision. And when the business is thinking about risk, the business always goes to uh, the COSO framework because enterprise risk management is how business people think. Now, COSO doesn't use these items that I have listed here. So the four R's of risk is a bright idea from Keon, but resilience is really based on operations. You know, what is the operational resilience of the organization? Revenue is a significant driver for a lot of businesses. Regulatory compliance, we've already talked about. And reputation I used to rage against, but it is a factual risk concern because there is uh, one thing that stands out. If you're not familiar with the concept of switching cost in economics, organizations that have a low switching cost are at greater risk if they have reputational harm because it is very easy for their customers to switch to a competitor. And so if you look at something like Equifax, when they had their data breach, Equifax only has two real competitors in the marketplace, and most of Equifax revenue comes from business to business contracts. So unless the business to business contract said that if we have a data breach, you can cancel your contract with, um, with no penalty, most of the businesses that were customers of Equifax are still customers of Equifax, even though they had a major data breach because the switching cost is high. At the same time, there are some great statistics that say that 66% of small businesses that have a data breach go out of business within a year because people have lost confidence in that organization. Small businesses have a very low switching cost. Businesses that don't have a lot of competitors have a high switching cost. So it starts to put into context, why does reputation matter? It is not gonna matter 100% of the time, but for the right types of organizations is gonna be something that you're concerned about and that you have to pay attention to.
Um, the audience is also going to matter. So who you're talking to within the organization makes a big difference about your messaging and your framing. And so I'm not going to go through all of this, but I recommend that everybody look at NIST 800-39 because the 800-39 divides the organization into three tiers where level one represents the board of directors, the CEO and the senior executive team. They have different priorities and they need information in a different format than level two. Level two represents what you would consider all the department directors or vice presidents in charge of something within the organizational hierarchy. And it is not until you get to level three that you start thinking about the information systems. Now, this is an ideal representation of how everything works. Unfortunately, most of your compliance programs and most of your security control catalogs focus exclusively on level three and completely overlook what's happening at level one and level two. And if the organization and the business are not involved in the security solution, security is not gonna happen. And so you can be offensive all day, but whatever you produce, if the people at level one and level two don't respond appropriately to the findings of your offensive security efforts, nothing is going to change and you're still going to be facing the situation that you're facing. Um, my final note, and I just recommend this so that you have a big picture about how everything ties together is it is going to be very valuable for all security people to master one risk management framework. Uh, there are two that are dominant. You have ISO 27005, which comes from the International Organization of Standardization. I didn't highlight that because there's money that you have to pay to get it. The ISO or the NIST 800- um, 39 is free to everybody. You can sign up and get it. I pulled this out of um, one of the classes that I do for free, so you can ignore the banner and all the other stuff. Um, Malcolm and I just spent a lot of time on um, one day just giving a session. And the reason that I left this here is because if you go to classllc.com slash um, CCL, I have a bunch of recordings that are free on YouTube that you guys can subscribe to, listen to, and it does a deeper dive in some of these conversations, but nothing that I have presented today for uh, Hack and Cast has any cost associated with it because my mission here is for education. I'm not here to sell you anything. I just want everybody to be smarter and do better at what they're doing. And in the words of my hero, Forrest Gump, that is all that I have to say about that. And so I'll turn off the slides. I will turn on my camera. I could only keep up with so much while um, everything was happening in the chat. And I was also talking, but if you guys have any questions, concerns, if you want to talk about anything, um, the floor is open and I will let the Hacking Cast team kind of facilitate what we're going to address for the couple of minutes that we have remaining. As a reminder, if you joined us late, if you go to www.cyberstrategyretreat.com, all Hacking Cast attendees um, can come to the conference for free. You'll see it in the Discord chat, but the code FOUNDER100 will give you 100% complimentary access to join a conference that I'm doing on the 14th and 15th of July. And it just extends my offer to make sure that everybody is educated and is in the best position for success, whether you're technical or non-technical. I believe everybody should know this stuff so that you can get raises, get bonuses, take over the world and make it a better place. <laughs> awesome. Um, it looks like there is a question. How do you communicate the lack of skills and staff in your security team as a risk to the business? It always comes down to numbers. Um, if I were doing a presentation to the business and my goal is to say that we don't have enough people, there are two things that are very valuable that you want to do. One, how much time is your team spending on certain activities? And what is the hourly labor cost of those individuals? And so in one of the, um, I didn't do it in the Cyber Career Lab, but I gave a presentation once where I broke it down and I said, you know, if you take your average help desk person who is responding to something that you could prevent with technology and your average help desk person costs the business $25 an hour, even if you're not paying that person $25 an hour, it allows you to do the math that says for every four hours that they spend responding to an incident or something that we could have prevented with software, we're spending $100. And so then you say, well, we spend 5,000 hours per year solving something at $100 for every four hours. And the software that I really want is only going to cost me $50. And so now whatever 5,000 times 25 is, because I can't do the math 
in my head, I think that's seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars, if I did it correctly, for spending seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars to solve a problem that we could solve with the fifty dollar purchase. I would take that same approach for the uh, HR component and say we're spending seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars to solve a problem that would cost us less if I hired two more people. Now, your um, security analyst, your SOC analyst, your security engineers generally don't cost seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars per person. So you simply used metrics to justify that it would be more cost effective to hire three people so that I expand the team instead of having one person try to do that kind of work and it costs that much money to the organization. And so you can play around with it. I just made up numbers. But one of the benefits of metrics, when you look at what's in the NIST 800-55, is you know, you'll see some interesting things when you start gathering the data where you say, it costs us this amount of money because 100% of people aren't doing security awareness training. And for every person that didn't do training that caused a breach, this was, was the cost of the breach. And so we spent this much money on whatever solution I used, this is the total cost to the organization for non-compliance with a policy. And now the cost of a data breach has nothing to do with what Gartner said. The cost of a data breach is what does it cost our company every time we allow people to still have access to the environment, but they don't do the training so that they don't do like Ren and Stimpy and click on the red button. And for those of you who have been around long enough, you'll you'll get the reference to Ren and Stimpy and the red button. <laughs> um, there was a, another question in Discord. Um, let me find it again. What if your board and executive management are tone deaf and you're too low on the totem pole under IT to do anything about it? If the board receives good information because you have formatted your metrics properly and they still ignore it and do something stupid, that is an indication that they don't take things seriously. And I would love to help you look for a new job. <laughs> because, um, in, you know, I, I taught at the graduate school at Georgia State. And one of the things that I told my MBA students is you have to recognize that most businesses are bad at business. They just out earn their stupidity. But eventually it catches up with you. Like, you know, I'm not picking on SolarWinds, but uh, one of the things that came out in SolarWinds was that they received information years ago that what happened in 2020 was going to happen at some point, and it was not a high enough priority for the decision makers to solve the problem. And it is possible that they will go out of business because of lost revenue, not that they're going to go out of business because of the breach exactly. And so it, then it gets you into things like uh, factor analysis of information risk that looks at the primary impact and the secondary impacts. Future loss of revenue would be a secondary impact that could really reinforce the story that you tell. So now it's not just what does Gartner say about the cost of a data breach, but you can do some analysis that says if our customers lose confidence, we're going to lose revenue, and the solution to this problem is less than the value that's being produced by the organization in this risky area that could generate some kind of harm. Okay, here's another one. What do you do when your supervisory level management act as gatekeepers, um, preventing important alerts from reaching decision makers? Uh, if I put my soldier hat on, one of the things that you find, uh, so I was not an officer, I was a non-commissioned officer. It requires a change in your attitude to say that my job is to do everything that I can to make my boss look good. And if you can wrap your mind around that, and if you have the ability to do that, because some bosses are just horrible and you need to seek employment elsewhere. But if you have the ability to do that in your company and you say, what I'm doing is for the benefit of the organization and the people that I care about, not for my glory, that change in mindset kind of equips you to say whatever it takes to set this person up for success, I'm going to do it. Now, you know, I we can have a uh, religious debate about this at another time because that's not what people here are here for. But what I personally believe is that if you work really hard to set other people up for success, you benefit as well. And so maybe you make your boss look so awesome that that person gets promoted and then you're, they're out of your way and then you move up a level and get to do some great stuff because you made somebody else look good. And so you just have to be patient enough and open enough to the idea that I want to set other people up for success because it benefits the greater good in the long term rather than what it does for me in the short term. Um, you said it was a good idea to master one framework. How do you suggest one practice using them with past incidents? 
question from a potential entry level professional who wants to break into cybersecurity? Well, the, when I said master frameworks, I was really talking about risk management frameworks. Um, the reason that you want to master the risk management frameworks is not because it's going to make you better at your day job being a security analyst or um, doing technical work. What it's going to do is it's going to improve the way that you communicate why what you're doing matters. Like, you know, if I take the uh, NIST risk management framework, because I've done it thousands of times, there are seven steps in the process where the prepare phase is the governance phase. And so then maybe as a security analyst, I understand the impact of my work on the governance that is required for this information system that we care about. Then the other phases are all related to things that happen in action. We have to select controls based on the type of information that's being stored, processed or transmitted. We have to implement controls. We have to verify that the controls work. Um, a lot of people that work as um, practitioners in security are on the implement controls or verify the controls are working. But understanding the framework helps you understand where does my work fit in the bigger scheme of things so that you understand your value because the work is stupid hard. We don't want you to get depressed and quit. But it also helps you understand how is what I'm doing contributing to the next part in the process. Because once I do that um, penetration test or that vulnerability assessment, or I do the patching or whatever else I'm going to do, the next phase in the process defined by those risk management frameworks is that the outcome of all of those efforts goes to a business person who accepts whatever risk remains after you've reduced risk as much as possible, and then it goes into production and then you do continuous monitoring. Whether I do NIST or ISO, the outcome is ultimately the same because all risk management follows the same approach, whether I'm doing financial risk, project risk, security risk, risk is risk. You always do an assessment, you reduce risk as much as possible, a business person accepts the residual risk, you operate or do whatever it is that you want to do, and then you maintain the acceptable level of risk throughout the life cycle. Most of the students and entry-level security people that I talk to don't have that basic understanding to know why their work matters in the entire process. So that's why I recommended that people learn a framework. It's also important to recognize that a risk management framework is different than a cybersecurity framework. So NIST has a risk management framework that's defined in eight, special publication 800-37. The cybersecurity framework is an additional adjacent framework that focuses on all the controls that you're gonna put in place to manage cybersecurity risk. But the risk management framework looks at a broader level and applies to all three of those levels in that organizational hierarchy. See, awesome. So you guys hear me rattling this off, so you know that I wasn't reading slides, uh, slide notes the whole time. <laughs> I actually know this stuff. <laughs> How do you change the culture of material risk, material risk takers, just granting a lot of dispensations and accepting the risk? Yeah, so that is a great question. The only way it's going to change is, is if you make them accountable for their decisions. So I'll tell you guys a, a quick story. Once upon a time, I lost my job because I convinced my boss to hold all the business people accountable for their risk management decisions. And then they said, oh my God, we can't have that. So they did a reorganization. They made me interview for my job and then pick somebody else. <laughs> but what that demonstrated was that I was on the right track. The issue was that the business didn't want to be accountable for their decisions. So if, you know, when, um, when FISMA was passed in 2002, I was at the Centers for Disease Control, and I was at the CDC for 12 years. It took us five years to go from nothing to something and fully implementing the risk management framework. And so this is not a slow process, but the thing that you have to, act, the thing that you have, to have to, um, to address that question is you have to have a willingness of the business to participate in the process. If the business isn't on board, nothing is going to change because they control the budget, they control the corporate priorities, they make all the decisions. There's only so much that you can do if you don't have executive buy-in and support for risk management or for cybersecurity or anything else. And you probably want to leave if they're not taking it seriously. All right. And we are at the top of the hour here. Um, I'm not sure, Kian, how much longer you want to stay on to do. Um, questions, you're welcome to stay in the, the Discord and maybe answer some of the questions that have popped up if you'd like. Actually, I will stay as long as you guys want to stay because I freed my schedule up to be here as long as I needed to be. Oh, okay. Awesome.
Awesome. Well, let's see if there's any other questions in GoToWebinar. Um, let's just... Hey, um, one other thing that I will do, and this is open to everybody, if you just say hack and cast, when you send the invitation, if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, I'm happy to connect with everybody here. And if anybody wants to talk to me in real life, I'm happy to do that also. Sounds awesome. Let me see. I'm just and trying. I apologize for my loud keyboard. I told you guys I was a gamer, so I have a mechanical keyboard because I kept breaking <laughs> my um, flimsy other keyboards. <laughs> Let's see. Dun, dun, dun. Um, the recording, um, this, will, this was recorded, and um, we generally post the recordings in the recording section on Discord. Um, we also, it, it goes out um, in the email with the uh, certificate of completion as well. There's a, the raw recordings, and then we'll do a little bit of editing, make it look prettier, and post that on YouTube as well. Yeah, and um, if, if you guys are wondering about the game while Megan looks for the next question, I am a monster on Overwatch. I've been playing since it came out. <laughs> uh, let me see. Um, yeah, so wanna... Overwatch and Madden is the answer to the question that popped up in Discord. <laughs> I just yeah. want to do a quick shout out here while we're while we're um, kind of winding this down. Um, many of you guys know the Ranger, or you don't know the Ranger. Um, He's kind of been our. He's kind of been lurking about in Discord and on these webcasts. Um, I just uh, wanted to let you know today is his last full time day with us. He'll be he'll be lurking about as a ten ninety nine. Um, we're really really sad to to lose him um, on a full time basis, but um, he's got other aspirations, and we're really excited for him. So I just wanted to give him a quick shout out and say thank you for all you've done. Um, to help us and support Wild West Hack and Fest and anti siphon training. Awesome. Yeah. We're going to miss you, Ranger. Yes, we are. Well, I don't see any other um, questions that are kind of jumping out at me, Keon. But if you want to stick around in uh, Discord, we will. Um, We'll keep that open. And again, if you want to reach out to Keon um, on LinkedIn, uh, you can do so as well. Um, but thanks again for being here, Keon. It was good to see you again. It's been a while, but I'm glad it seems like everything's going well over there. So I'm, I'm really, I'm really happy for you, for you guys, and um, hope hope everyone else is okay. Over there. I have a, I have a parting gift. For anybody that's interested, if they give me two minutes, I saw a couple of questions in the chat about metrics, and I have risk management metrics, compliance metrics, network access metrics. I actually have examples of metrics that I use in real life. So it just took me a second to sanitize them. Um, <laughs> let me make sure I don't have any uh, customer information in here because that would be detrimental to my uh, real work. <laughs> Yeah, so there's nothing in here. Uh, what I'll do is I'll post it as a PDF, and then you guys can build upon this, but everything that's in here is based on NIST 800-55. And so I didn't just throw it out there just to say it and sound smart. It's something that I actually use, but it has some, um, it has some good stuff in there that people should be able to do something with. Yeah, it'll, it'll take me like two minutes. So, Megan, if you want to okay. queue up the next thing, I'll have this done in just a second. Well, I really, I think that that's pretty much it from our side. Um, but again, um, Deadwood uh, is open for registration. Our classes are open for registration as well. If you've already registered and you want to add training to your existing uh, registration, you need to send me an email, support at wildwesthackandfest.com. And I want to thank everybody again for joining us. And um, Keon will stay in Discord and post some extra things. Um, but if not, we will see you on the next one. Oh, hey, one thing I want to give a plug oh. about for training is that, you know, I said in the beginning that, you know, I've had the pleasure of, you know, John doesn't invite me for Thanksgiving, <laughs> but uh, he is a fabulous person and I'm a huge fan of his work. 
for anybody that has the opportunity to do the training that he has, his training is some of the best. And the people he has associated with him, he didn't pay me for this, <laughs> but it is a practical <laughs> statement. So I did want to make sure that I put it out there that if you're thinking about training, uh, this is going to be a good option to do the training that Megan was talking about in the future, because the smarter you are, the more employable you are, which is going to produce good results for you. Well, thank awesome. you for that. Um, that vote of confidence, we appreciate that. And for the shout out there, um, I just posted the link in, in the Discord um, on our upcoming training. Um, so I think people have asked for your LinkedIn. Um, and I think you're probably going to be flooded with requests, Kian. So thank you again so much for, for being here. Um, as a gift, um, it may take us a little while because we're trying to catch up from Reno and everything, but we do have um, a Wild West Hack and Fest. Oh, let me see if I can get it on here. Excellent. Uh, I, I will take it. Point. That looks awesome. Yeah, they're pretty amazing. We've had, we were able to give out quite a few um, in Reno a few weeks. We'll be sending one to you as well. So um, thank you again for uh, being with us today and sharing your knowledge. Um, you know, again, that's what Wild West Hack and Fest and Anti-Siphon Training is all about, is, is sharing that knowledge, transferring it to others um, so they can excel. So very cool. Yeah, right. I'll, I'll come back anytime you guys are scraping the bottom of the barrel and, and... <laughs> yeah. I bet if we asked the crowd, they would probably say bring him back soon. Yeah, uh, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Um, again, keep an eye out on our schedule uh, for upcoming Hacking Cast, upcoming Roundups, and Deadwood 2021. We look forward to seeing everyone there. You guys take care. All right, you too. Bye. Bye. -bye.